Welcome to On Time, Every Time, delivering hospital at home ancillary services, a webinar sponsored by the Hospital at Home Users Group, presented in partnership with the American Academy of Home Care Medicine and the American Hospital Association. Next slide, please. We'd like to recognize the generous support of the John A. Hartford Foundation for the Users Group and this webinar series. Next slide. And before we get started, a few housekeeping details. Uh, first of all, please submit your questions via the Q&A option uh, at the bottom of your screen. Due to the large audience for today's webinar, you're, uh, you've been placed on mute. Uh, if you do have any issues, please contact Noah Levine at the address on the screen and levine at aboutscp.com, or you can send him a message via the Zoom chat feature. Uh, we'll remind you during the course of the of the webinar, but the slides and a, and a recording of the webinar will be available through the hospital home users group org website in our in, and in our TA center uh, in the next day or two. Next slide, please. It's now my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Dr. Bruce Leff. A member of the, H, the hospital at home users group leadership team, Dr. Leff has been a leader of the hospital at home movement in the United States since the mid nineties, when he helped pioneer the model at the Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Today, he is professor at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine where he directs the Center for Transformative Geriatric Research. Please take it away, Dr. Leff. Next slide. Thank you, John. Next slide. So just like to welcome you uh, as John did to this users group webinar. I uh, just also want to tell you a little bit about the users group. User groups started forming about 18 months ago or so. It started with active hospital at home programs, and we formed several work groups to work on issues like program standards, quality metrics, as well as payment and regulatory issues. In the wake of the CMS waiver, we've used the users group to launch this technical assistance capability that's uh, providing these webinars and other resources that we'll be able to tell you about uh, at the end of the webinar. But you see here the user group URL, uh, as well as uh, the CAPC URL as well. Next. So as John noted, this is one in a series of webinars that started in, uh, back in December. Uh, today is on time, every time delivering hospital at home ancillary services, and that's today. We have another webinar next week on the 23rd, uh, evaluating hospital at home quality and safety. Uh, and you can get the full schedule of events at the users group or at the TA center. And if you have ideas on other technical assistance needs as you work on hospital at home, please feel free to send some me messages along to us. The other thing is feel free to join the users group. When you go on the site, you can join, there's no fee, and you can engage in uh, online conversations with other members, get questions answered, crowdsource information. Next. So today we have on time, every time, delivering hospital at home ancillary services. So this is an operations focused webinar. Uh, this is actually the second uh, operation session that we had last last uh, webinar we had Karen Titchener uh, talking about some elements of operations uh, and next today we have Dr. Peter Reed who's the medical director at Unity Point Hospital at Home he's one of the leaders in the user group he helps to lead the program standards group uh, he's a terrific guy and rumor has it that uh, he does juggle chainsaws in his spare time and we can ask him about that later Peter, take it away. Uh, th thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you, John. Um, next slide, please. So I'll start off with a few learning objectives. <clears throat> I'd like to learn, uh, show you how to learn to approach the development of acute hospital care at home with a flexible perspective and explore some of the key decisions that may be encountered when developing your ancillary service contracts. And along the way, share some lessons learned from our journey at Unity Point. Next slide, please. So I'd like to begin with uh, Unity Point, how we, we run our program. So next slide, please. 
We began in 2018 as an ambulatory population health service uh, clinic servicing our next generation ACO and at risk contracts with our spectrum of services. Our first service line that we launched was hospital to home, a replacement for traditional hospitalization for patients with certain medical conditions. We then launched our waiver based services, which are post discharge home visits for next generation ACO beneficiaries who have had a facility encounter and care management home visits for those next generation ACO beneficiaries who have had a visit with their PCP and who are at risk for decompensation. Through multiple PDSA cycles, process mapping and project development, we developed primary care at home, an urgent clinic style visit in the home as an extension of the primary care provider for patients who require early intervention to prevent the need for escalated services, such as ED utilization or hospitalization. We then added on annual wellness visits and advanced care planning for those patients who have a barrier to traditional clinic access. These are the patients who often no-show or fail to schedule. They're only seen in the ED or hospital during times of crisis. We're an ambulatory-based model of care acting as an extension of the clinic into the patient's home. Our aim is to provide ambulatory-based care alternatives to reduce our patient's need for ED, hospital, ED and hospital utilization. In addition to meeting the traditional medical need, we pride ourselves in the observational component inherent in delivering care in the home. This is highlighted by an observational medication reconciliation, where a clear picture of what the patient is or is not taking can be seen. As an ambulatory clinic, we aligned with our institution and utilized Epic Ambulatory for our EMR. For all of our services, we partnered very closely with our in-source service, service lines, such as durable medical equipment, infusion pharmacy, home care, and our robust wide clinic care management system. Prior to this waiver, we had ambulatory contracts that allowed us to provide hospital to home. These contracts included pharmacy, infusion pharmacy, DME for oxygen therapy, home care, laboratory services, imaging, and therapy. All of this work aligned with our clinic arm of our institution. With this waiver, we have now developed a closer relationship with our hospital arm and use Epic inpatient for those patients participating in the acute hospital care at home program. So what, what services are needed? Let's, let's highlight the list real quickly here. You'll need pharmacy, infusion services, respiratory care, really focusing on that oxygen delivery, DME, diagnostics, which include uh, things like lab, radiology, possibly EKG, ultrasound, echo, and other, other diagnostics, transportation, food services, therapies, and social work. So I start with, how ready are you? And I know that we've had a few webinars already about this, but this, this is very, very key to developing these ancillary service contracts. Next slide, please. So evaluate, a part of evaluating your readiness is uh, obtaining that strategic endorsement. You wanna look at your hospital leadership. And uh, I think this has been highlighted previously uh, in predicting some of the barriers and having meetings before the meetings, getting really people on board before you bring it to a larger audience. There'll be a lot of political navigation uh, throughout these meetings before the meetings and always really striving to keep it collaborative with a shared goal for your patients. Also, it's very important to cast a wide net early. Of course, you're gonna include your C-suite, but really try and pull in leadership representatives from uh, that are close to the work, such as your EMR analyst, revenue cycle, accounting, financial, uh, your vice president of medical affairs, chiefs of nursing, clinical quality. It's very important to tell stories from the heart during these, uh, during these discussions. And then be ready to explain financials for the head. We've also found that in, in that wide audience, it's also maybe important to include legal Next slide, please.
As we developed our acute hospital care at home service line, we sought input early from our local and state regulator, regulators and hospital accreditors. Not only did, did this allow them to be involved early, but it helps ease some of the concerns of the hospital leadership. Even though we had an ambulatory hospital to home model with ancillary providers, we paused and reflected on our service line availability. We reevaluated if our ambulatory partners could meet the needs of this new waiver. For those of you who are just starting, a helpful tip is to look, look for partners with other service lines, such as hospice or home care. For example, who provides in service infusion services for your home care partner? Next slide. Additionally, other helpful tools when developing your ancillary services includes project management and process mapping. An example of our internal process mapping is seen here. And this is a very rough draft of one of our process maps. And if you can decipher it, it should not be used for any program development. This is simply a tool that we use to highlight the ideal state, identify barriers, or just work out the details. As you launch, you also want to have scheduled debrief sessions so you can highlight what is working and what needs to be revised. This will lead you into multiple PDSA cycles, including system analytics for reporting of outcomes will help you uh, report outcomes for the waiver and allow you to develop internal outcomes. As you develop, including uh, departments such as marketing can help you create clear messaging tools for your audience. Think of how you're going to mes message this to medical staff versus leadership versus your patients. Next slide, please. So along with evaluating readiness, all of the service lines will require contracting between the ancillary service and the hospital. You'll wanna think of questions such as, who is the main hospital and ancillary service contract? Because they will need to remain engaged as you go live and test the system. You'll wanna clarify expectations early. And for most hospital, hospital at home programs, there is an expected time, turnaround time frame. For us at Unity Point, we use a two hour uh, time frame. How does this change on weekends and nights? Can your ancillary service provider meet the needs on a Saturday afternoon? How will the results report and image be incorporated into your EMR? What are your internal charge agreements? Is it cost plus 10%? And how and who will manage the charges and claims? The hospital staff involved in the individual departments will additionally need ongoing training and recognition on how to process these internal orders. For example, you don't wanna send a radiology tech all over your hospital looking for, for this patient. Next slide, please. I really want to highlight that it's important to remember the goal is not to adopt the services of the hospital in the home, but to adapt the services to deliver safe, high quality care in the home. Adapt versus adopt. Okay, let's get down into the weeds a little bit here. Conditions of participation. Most of you will become familiar with your hospital's conditions of participation. They often differ from your institution's policies. Conditions of participation are high level and oftentimes left, left up for some interpretation. Therefore, your policies at your hospital are often much more specific than conditions of participation. Therefore, you're at risk of being out of compliance because you are violating your own policy. An oversimplified solution to a very complex problem is to amend your policy. And again, I can't stress that enough. It's, it's an oversimplified, oversimplified solution. But this is one strategy that we have used at Unity Point is to amend some of our policies 
within the barriers of the conditions of participation. Next slide, please. Let's dive into pharmacy. Pharmacy alone could be its own complete webinar. And I'm not going to try and go over every little detail for, ph for pharmacy. This will really be an overview and to highlight questions you should be thinking about. As you can see, the beginning of the condition of participation for pharmaceutical services is rather broad. Most hospital systems have a much more detailed policy and procedure in place for the administration of pharmaceutical services. Therefore, you will need to work with your hospital administration team and examine these policies, procedures, and how they are adapted or modified for the acute hospital care at home waiver. The pharmacy service will not and cannot be a carbon copy of the inpatient service. So you're not going to install an automated medication dispensing system in each patient's home. So there are new logistical barriers to work through. Additionally, facility-based care limits our ability to better understand what the patient is or is not taking. The observational medication reconciliation is key to this. It really highlights what is the patient really taking. Sometimes patients are started on formulary medications while in the traditional hospital that interact with a home medication that is not known until after performing a med rec. You may find yourself enrolling a patient with one med list only to get them home and discover a completely different one. I'd like to highlight this with, with an example uh, from, from our work. A patient was admitted to our service, service line. They were uh, at home and we were going over their medications, this observational component. We were pulling all of their medications off, off the shelves. In and amongst all of their medications, they were taking Plavix and Spironolactone. The Spironolactone was twice a day and the Plavix was once a day. And as we looked inside the pill bottle, both pill bottles, we found that the same pill was in both bottles, yet they were two different prescriptions. We verified that the patient was in fact taking both of these medications. We later identified that the patient was taking Plavix. That was the medication in both pill bottles. So instead of just taking one Plavix a day, they were taking three tablets a day. They were getting too much Plavix and not enough spironolactone. This patient was at high risk for a poor outcome and a bleed. Had this person come into the emergency department with a bleed, we would have just chalked it up to them being on Plavix, never ever knowing that they were taking three times the dose. I believe that through this, this single observational medication reconciliation, we averted a poor outcome for this one patient. Next slide, please. So here at Unity Point, we split our pharmacy into infusion services and traditional inpatient pharmacy for our oral and inhaled meds. This is something that we uniquely do. Uh, your pharmacy may be set up a little bit differently, but I wanted to highlight um, why, we, why we did this. One example I would like to share is to try and find a partner that already provides ambulatory home infusion services. The reason for this is that they will be much more comfortable and familiar with the process of delivering care in the home. The ambulatory infusion partner will have a delivery system, pumps and poles versus elastomeric devices, supplies such as flushes, start kits, sharps, and alcohol swabs, all put together in a consistent package. A home infusion pharmacy will operate with an understanding of unique guidelines for transport, delivery, and setup. For example, a home infusion pharmacy would understand the USP 800 rules. So this isn't to say you shouldn't run this out of your normal inpatient pharmacy, but this may be a, uh, a better option uh, that, that maybe gets you off the ground quicker. Your traditional inpatient pharmacy can package new, new medications, dose changes, such as your oral and inhaled. Some institutions are even 
deploying a pre-filled med planner that's pre-packaged for several days. For your institution, you will need to determine how all of these medications are delivered. Another question you'll need to internally manage is how will you handle controlled substances? Will patients take their own controlled substances? At Unity Point, we do not provide any IV controlled substances in the home. This is really because of the monitoring uh, that is required, and it really speaks to the underlying etiology that's uh, causing that, that level of need. Rarely are we ever escalating their oral chronic medications for their acute needs. Next slide. So here at Unity Point, we are working on changing our policies and procedures, and we allow our patients to supply their own medications and take them in the home. Of course, that's after we verify their, their capacity to do this and that they're even in, that those medications are available in the home. We document against our electronic medical record, EPIC, and for our new oral medications, we are dispensing them from our inpatient pharmacy. For infusions, we are again using our, our home infusion pharmacy. The charges for the medications dispensed will, will need to be generated. And therefore, this is why it's in, important to include revenue cycle and EMR leadership early on in your discussions. Next slide, please. So respiratory care, oxygen, and DME. I'm lumping all of this together as you will most likely have a supplier that will offer these services together. Most of your needs will be short-term oxygen. Here at Unity Point, we contract internally with our own DME to supply oxygen. The cost, which is several hundred dollars a month, plus the delivery, plus uh, uh, an overage charge, is invoiced back to the hospital. In the hospital, oxygen use ties them to a limited space. In the home, you will need to use longer tubing, which unfortunately does become a tripping hazard. However, the patient will be up ambulating more. Uh, an anecdotal uh, experience that we've had has been taking care of COVID positive patients finishing off their hospitalization at home. I've personally found that we've been able to titrate them off oxygen quicker because they're up moving around, taking deeper breaths and not tied to that hospital bed. With oxygen, you'll wanna consider if there will be any mod modifications to their home equipment, such as their uh, PAP treatments. Again, revenue cycle and your EMR leadership uh, will need to be present to determine how this service will be charged and then paid through the electronic medical record. What triggers are there in your EMR to drop that claim. Next, please. So diagnostics, lab radiology and cardiovascular services. Let's start off with lab. Lab, and when I say lab, I'm talking about blood, urine, stool. For most of you, this will be run in your traditional hospital lab your electronic medical record and charges are really already set up. So this is probably the, the easiest ancillary service uh, to put together. Again, it'll still be very, very important to involve those service lines early. And you'll encounter questions such as who will draw the labs? Where will they be delivered? Who will deliver them? How to handle uh, specific labs? You also want to think about expected turnaround time. Inform the hospital what to do with the orders. So for example, here at Unity Point in our traditional hospital, when an order is placed in EPIC, a phlebotomist is dispatched up to the floor unless it's identified as a floor collect. So with this process, we had to involve our service line lead early and our EMR analyst to learn how to uh, highlight that order and to give ongoing education. We really didn't want to send a phlebotomist all over the hospital looking for this patient. 
there'll be diff some difficulty in obtaining certain labs that require specific handling. These would be your lactic acid, your ABG, some stool studies. At Unity Point, we're really running your basic chemistries, CBC, INR, UA, respiratory swabs. Less often, we're doing blood cultures in the home. This is really a reflection of the severity of illness of the patient and what has already been done for them in the ER or the hospital before they transition back home. If you're needing frequent ABGs or lactic acids, this patient likely needs, and I'm gonna quote Al Sue on this, the diagnostic firepower of the traditional hospital, and they may not be appropriate for your service. Next slide, please. Radiology. For most, you'll need to find a regional mobile partner. If you don't know who this is, you could reach out to your local nursing home to see if anyone's providing them with mobile imaging. Another place to look is your hospice partners. The provider may also have other services such as EKG, ultrasound, and echo available. You'll need to navigate how these results make it into the EMR and charges. Of course, this is a negotiation and how charge capture and the payment is triggered. At Unity Point here in central Iowa, we partner with Biotech Mobile X-Ray, who then does the image and then sends that image over to our PAC system for our radiologists to read. The benefit is that our radiologists already contract with this, this company, and so they're really quite familiar with it. Again, just like with lab, you'll need training with the staff so as not to send a radiology technician up to the floor to find a patient. For Unity Point, we mostly order x-rays, chest x-rays and pelvis and, and some, some uh, long bone. This is, of course, if it's number one needed and not already done in the ER or hospital prior to the, their transition home. Again, the severity of disease will limit the need for advanced imaging or will already be done prior to the transfer back home. New slide. So I'd like to uh, highlight cardiovascular services such as EKG, venous ultrasounds and echo. Fortunately here in central Iowa, Unity Point, uh, our partner biotech does offer EKG venous ultrasounds and echo. We did discover uh, early on that these are managed by a separate service line, cardiovascular service. So as a part of our learning, we had to figure out that that even existed and then pull that, that representative in early for ongoing discussions. Again, the same issues arise loading, how these are loaded into your EMR, who reads, charge capture, et cetera. Next slide. Transportation. This can become a difficult conversation with, with between hospital leadership and your transformational service. Just expect it to be. Hospitals often have a policies that policy that dictates how and who can transport a patient. During this conversation, it may be beneficial to have the legal team also present to help navigate some of these concerns. You may have patients sign waivers or included in your consent form. For example, here at Unity Point, our, within the four, four walls of the traditional hospital, for medically stable patients, we have medical transport services. These transport services are staffed by individuals that are not clinicians, not able to give medicines, not able to diagnose and treat. However, if we transport a patient, regardless of medical stability between campuses, say from our West Campus to our downtown campus, we use an ambulance that's fully stocked with medications, ACLS gear, specially trained staff, paramedics usually. And what I'm highlighting is that there's a different level of care to take somebody just across town versus down to the CT scanner. So I'd like to pause and have you reflect on adapting, not adopting. Under our ambulatory model of hospital to home, we have been providing safe, high quality care for our patients for several years now. 
with our ambulatory and inpatient models of hospital to home, we allow the patient to be transported from home or uh, from the ED or hospital by a family vehicle. This is because of the patient population we are caring for. If they're too unstable or we're concerned for acute decompensation where we need that critical monitoring provided by an ambulance, then I would argue that this patient would probably not do all that well at home. If they're unable to use a private vehicle, we have a transport van. And again, if none of these modalities work, the patient then stays in the traditional hospital. That's our safety mechanism. Next slide, please. Food service. You'll need to decide if you're going to internally source this or an external source. Internally sourced uh, options include boxed meals versus externally sourced meals like Meals on Wheels. Again, who and how, uh, you know, and your contact uh, uh, contact partners will be will be very important. Treatment in the home allows you to explore and discuss food insecurities that could be missed by questions alone. It also starts the conversation about diet restrictions like salt, fat, carbs, and how to read labels of the food, food they eat. I'd like to insert a story about uh, a patient who had advanced heart failure who we were caring for in hospital to home and we were going over their salt intake. And of course they told me they don't salt their food. They don't even have a salt shaker in the house. So I asked them, well, what do they typically eat for dinner? Because it was getting close to dinner time. And they said, corn dogs, corn dogs. So I knew in my mind, that's where all the salt was coming from. But the patient had no idea. So instead of talking about salt restrictions and why it's important, I just went over to the refrigerator, opened it up and pulled out the box of frozen corn dogs. And we were able to read that label together. It made a large difference for that patient looking at a label of food they ate versus something that they may not have ever touched. Next slide, please. Social work. Social work, therapy, physical and occupational speech. I'm, I'm going to lump these all together since most of you will likely source them from the same location. A hint here will be your home care partner. At Unity Point, we have partnered with our insourced home care agency for these services. These providers will be leased from home care to our hospital through a cost shifting mechanism. The documentation and charges will still be in our inpatient electronic medical record. And for most patients, they'll be ambulatory. And so they may not need immediate therapy needs. So as you're building up your system, you'll want to think about how much time and training you'll do with with your therapists and social work because they may not be used very often. So you'll, you'll have this gap of train and then the time and then you'll need them and they'll forget. So it's beneficial to consider a streamlined process for documentation. At Unity Point, we're using downtime forms that can be scanned into the electronic medical record until our program grows and can sustain additional training. Additionally, if they need ongoing therapy needs after your, your session, you can consider a referral to home care for those ongoing therapy needs. So next slide, please. So I like to highlight a few lessons learned here. And next slide, please. The biggest lesson that we learned through delivering transformational care is to adapt versus adopt. You will be challenging the status quo at your hospitals. And so 
be prepared. Cast a wide net early and think about who we are missing. For example, early in our discussions, we completely missed cardiovascular services. Expect that you will need to change as you launch and take care of the first few patients. Your model will not be perfect, and so don't be afraid to fail. Be ready to go through multiple PDSA cycles to make it better. Always look for in-source solutions. Uh, instead of trying to reinvent radiology services from your, your hospital, look for those uh, out, outsource partners that may be already doing that. Remember to reflect on the wins, tell stories, and share outcomes. Next slide. So thank you and uh, appreciate questions. Peter, this is Bruce. Thank you so much yeah. for uh, that really terrific uh, webinar. And I don't know if my picture can go back on screen so I, Peter can see me, that might be nice. Um, so we're getting a lot of questions. So here, here are some contacts from Peter's group if you wanna reach out to the folks at Unity Point with questions following the webinar. Peter was nice enough to volunteer himself and his colleagues to take questions. So feel free to look at that. And just a reminder, and this came up in the Q&A, the, um, the slides will be available following the webinar within the next day or so on the users group site. And let's just go to the next slide as we take questions. Um, so again, here's the users group, the site for tools and technical assistance. And also just to highlight that there's a new resource on the site. We've annotated, actually Nancy Gwynn from uh, Presbyterian uh, has annotated the uh, CMS waiver uh, document with a bunch of ideas for each of the conditions of participation and the waiver requirements. It's a terrific resource and just want to commend you to it. So Peter, a lot of questions coming in in the, in the uh, yeah. Q&A. Uh, I'm gonna try and stick with the ones, at least to start, that are focused a bit on, um, on the topics that you focused on. Uh, one that I love the notion of adapt uh, versus adopt. I think that there's a lot of wisdom uh, in, that, in that approach. And um, just wanted to, so you talk about the need for your program to adapt. I was wondering if you could speak to how you bring, you know, your partner vendors along and help them adapt. I mean, my experience, you know, working with a number of, of program builds is that um, sometimes partners will, almost always partners will promise you the moon, as in I can get that oxygen there in an hour and they'll swear up and down on a stack of Bibles, they will sign contracts, and then push comes to shove the first 10 cases, it's, it's kind of a flop. And I'm just wondering if you have any wisdom there. Yeah, um, so uh, let me decouple some of that. There, there is a lot, of, a lot of taking people along the change curve. Some people will be you know, ready and excited. You, know, you talk about uh, you know, changing up hospital care and, and medicine in general, they're right with you. They, they are ready for that. And then you're gonna have people that, um, that are almost there and that you need to tip over. And then there'll, there'll be people that just will fold their arms up and resist. And so you need to just be ex expecting that people will be on different change curves. With your suppliers, it's really, really important to hold them accountable and to keep them very close. And that's why, you know, through the, the PDSA cycles and debriefing, you're, you're bringing, bringing those stories back in a timely fashion, but really, you know, keeping, keeping them accountable for that. If, if they're not able to deliver oxygen for four hours, but you said you wanted a one hour turnaround, then you need to look at what, what caused that uh, uh, delay and maybe they're not the right partner. And so you're gonna have to have to really hold them accountable. That's great. I, I have yeah. seen and wondering if you use some programs sometimes with their contractors will 
you know, before they go live, we'll use tabletop kinds of exercises and bring people into a room and they kind of go, kind of act out the process yep. map. And I'm wondering if you've ever done that and if, if that has been a useful technique. We, we have, and it has, has been very helpful when we launch new uh, pieces, such as incorporating telehealth into our service line. Uh, that, was, that was very beneficial. I think what has been very helpful for us, Bruce, is we had an ambulatory model uh, that was very successful at, at delivering high quality safe care for uh, multiple years now. And it really became a, a renegotiation of those contracts. And so we already knew, uh, thankfully, what we were getting to. But I would, I would offer that, you know, for programs that are just starting, just launching, having that um, uh, dry run, so to speak. And we did that when we had our first, very first hospital to home patient. Prior to that, we had a dummy patient that we ran through everything. We had them even come into the ER and uh, everything. So um it really helps kind of work out the kinks no yeah. i think that's a terrific terrific approach i just want to go back to the notion of you know we we have talked about readiness on other webinars in this series and, and just want to go back because something um the way you told the story of unity point struck me was the idea that your program developed over time um you had been developing your team over time and I'm just struck by the fact that with the waiver and many new organizations getting into hospital at home, you know, a lot of the people who were probably involved in your program early on and over time were, were sort of volunteers. Mm -hmm. My bet is that a lot of the programs that are starting out are experiencing the, the dynamic of people that they're working with are volunteered as opposed to volunteering. And, yeah. and just wondering if you have any tips on for, for people who are leading those sorts of you know, forced labor teams as opposed to volunteer labor teams and, sure. and tips for bringing them along. Yeah, Bruce, I, th I think it backs up to finding the right right person for the right right spot. I think that, you know, the right seat on the bus sort of scenario. Um, you want to look for uh, partners and colleagues that um, traditionally think outside the box, uh, may, may challenge the status quo, um, are, are the ones that, that come up with creative solutions. Uh, those, are, those are the people that, that will gravitate towards this work, um, but they also might need that push. They also might need the, hey, why don't you come over and join us for this meeting? And um, so looking for the right, the right person uh, to help, help in this work. Thanks for that. Um, there are several questions about um, certain services coming to the homes and people mm -hmm. were wondering whether you use or had thought about using point of care labs or point of care <laughs> ultrasound yep. uh, and how uh, aerosolized respiratory uh, services are set up, how those are set up. Yeah. So point of care ultrasound, we are doing that um, in, a, in a limited fashion. We're not billing for it at the moment. Um, it is adjunctive uh for for us um really really doing doing it for our heart failure patients looking for volume status uh and lung exams um point of care laboratory studies we've looked at that um and just for us um and and that's just unity point the the additional input for from managing that equipment and all the certifications and trainings um, is, was just a little bit too much for our institution. And um, I know other institutions are, are using it with great success, um, but, but we do not, we rely on our traditional inpatient, inpatient lab for that. Um, if we were to do point of care, you know, we would just look, how does that incorporate into the EMR? And then it becomes, how does that charge capture get get billed and, and all of that. And so that's that's why we have revenue cycle people that have great experience in this and pulling them in early is is absolutely necessary. Um, was there another uh, another question on there, Bruce? Um, sort of the use of aerosolized, you know, aerosolized. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So that. we're uh, we're allowing our patients to use their own own equipment for that. Um, our patients are screened for COVID prior 
in the ER, all, all of our patients through an algorithmic approach are screened for COVID. And so we kind of already know what we're walking into there, um, but we're all, you know, using PPE and, and uh, covering as, as appropriate for right. those patients, yeah. I think here's a question that came out from the, from the audience that I think fits into that adopt versus adapt. Um, and it concerns food and food delivery. Mm -hmm. uh, and the question is for food delivery, can there be consideration for family to provide food or maybe yes. even provide family with food? You know, it could go the other way. So just yes. wonder how you think about the adaptation notion it, there. Yeah. Um, from a majority of our patients, um, they're eating their, their own, own food. Um, and that's, that's number one. They're, they're comfortable with it. They're familiar with it. Um, but it also opens up the door when we're in there to discuss those, those restrictions, to actually see them preparing the food and say, you know, that's not not a low low salt option or a low carb option. Here here is a better idea, and and so there is uh, family coaching at at the moment. But we we allow our patients to eat eat their their own home meals, and then we really try and work with them. Um, I was a hospitalist for a number of years, Bruce, and so I was very accustomed to putting people on these very very strict diets while in the hospital. And I'd pat myself on the back and go, "We put you on a low carb diet and a low salt diet." And, you know, good for us. And then we'd send them home and that patient would go in and eat whatever they wanted. So um, it's, it's kind of a really a reflection of where, where we're at with medicine and that we can do a lot more education and teaching in the home uh, at the elbow for the patient than just handing them something or making it for them. That's helpful, Peter. Yeah. Um, so I want to go back to the, I was really, um, Really happy to hear hear you talk about taking a quality improvement approach and the notion of running multiple P plan do study act quality improvement cycles and just wondering if you can give folks tips for you know how those get organized is it only within the team or are you are you bringing people from all different groups in the hospital as it might pertain to their particular thing how, how is that done and who does that on your team. Yeah, so um, that, that goes back to having project management assistance. Um, we have robust operations and clinical leadership, and then also having project management, those, those uh, people that, that think just like project managers that can help bring groups together for those debrief sessions. And uh, we have several debrief sessions uh, throughout the week where we're talking about these processes. And if we have uh, impromptu needs, then we're bringing in that, that specific service line on an impromptu meeting, but then really looking towards the larger meetings um, to kind of highlight what's going well, what, what can we work on, and then also sharing those great success stories. Right. And, and those, I assume, are really very small tests of change, like running what's the usual time cycle for a, for a PDSA cycle? Is that usually a few days, a week, two weeks? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's usually usually within just a few days. Good. Um, uh, you know, I can think of one, one already this morning, uh, <laughs> that, which was a tube feed for a patient. And so, you know, going through that, who delivers, how do we deliver it? Where are we going to pick it up? Who's, how is that going to be built? Um, and then we're then ready for the next patient that, that comes along. Great. Um, question from in the uh, Q and a was, um, uh, the notion of documenting oral medication intake, and just um, folks are wondering how how you accomplish that. Mm -hmm. So if if they take their own exactly. home medications, yeah, I think yeah. That's the intent. yeah. So um, a lot of our patients already have their med planner set up. Uh, that's that's something that we really strive with our patients, um, and. You know, once they have a med planner set up, then you can really look in and say, yep, you did take them. Um, we're also, you know, really also trusting our patients to work with us. If, um, if they didn't take their dose of metoprolol this morning, then we need to figure out why uh, is, are they having side effects from it? Did they forget? Um, what other things can we put in place to help them? And then, then that really, really brings about, you know, let's put a med, med planner in place. And so 
um, it, it also is a place for us to navigate uh, discussions and, and barriers for them to, to take their medications. Great. Um, and you talked about stories and the use of stories. Um, are they always patient stories? Do you, you know, now that you're into this and doing all this terrific work on the organization, within the organization, you know, are there different stories you tell to different audiences within the organization? Uh, I really like patient stories. Um, our organization is, is uh, patient centric and, and really that, that speaks to the heart of what, what we do. Um, in appropriate forums, we do bring up process stories, such as the, the tube feed example. But I think it really gives more context when we put that together with, with a specific patient and show how uh, we came together to fulfill a need. Um, there's one um, aspect, and I'm, I'm going to bother you with it because I don't think when Karen gave her talk last week she spoke about it so um, and if it, feel free to take a pass on it but there was a question in the Q&A on how are you involving uh, specialist consultation in the model if you could sure yeah um, a majority of our patients would be typically managed by by hospitalists so an, an internist or a family practitioner um, in our in our model, we, we work very closely with our specialists. Um, and so if, if a patient with advanced heart failure is going home off the cardiology service, they're, they're our colleague. Um, and so if we get run into questions at home, then we're reaching out to that team directly, uh, a phone call. And most of us have, have uh, each other's phone numbers. And so it becomes really a, a, you know, a collaboration for that patient. Um, and I think that, that we benefit from kind of our, our smaller size, um, but it's just an open, open line of dialogue between, between the two services or Thanks. three services. Yeah. Great. Um, I think we've covered many of the questions in the Q&A. There were several on charge capture, but I'm, there was a number of those, and I'm wondering whether we need to be thinking about creating a resource for that. Uh -huh. uh, I would say just at a high level for the questions that are there, I'm, I'm going to add a dimension to the adapt versus adopt. And I think on charge capture and what gets included in the DRG and all of that, I would say that's when you just think about things the way a hospital thinks about things, you know, and things will get rolled into that DRG instead of everything being um, rolled out in a separate in a separate approach, but I think that might be something for for future work. And maybe just one last question from uh, from a colleague: Do you involve residents in your program? Do you have to, is it a teaching service? Not yet. Um, we do we do have uh, a robust internal medicine and, and family practice program here in the Des Moines area. Um, and my ideal state would be to involve them early um, because. There's nothing like home growing somebody who, to join you as a partner. Don't or your replacement. <laughs> or, or, my, or my replacement, yeah, yeah. Um, well, good, I think uh, we're, um, we're, up for, we're, down, uh, we're out of time. Um, again, I would point you in the direction of the user group and you have the, the URLs uh, in front of you. We do have, um, next slide please. We do have another, the last in this series of webinars next week on quality and safety. I believe David Levine from Brigham uh, and Women's Hospital will be leaving, leaving that webinar. And next slide. Uh, thanks, thank you very much for participating today. If you have ideas on future webinar topics that you'd like to see us work on or future technical assistance uh, topics that we should be working on, let us know. Uh, and until then, we'll, we'll until next week. We'll see you. Thanks for thanks for joining today. Really appreciate it.